Bienvenidos a Desvenando Noticias. Esta sería la tercera entrega de los niños huérfanos que viajaron en trenes y poblaron las ciudades o los pueblos en Estados Unidos, especialmente en el oeste del país. Así es que, aunque la historia de los niños huérfanos empieza en 1854, no hay muchos documentos que nos ayuden a encontrar relatos de los primeros niños. Quizá lo más que podamos encontrar son personas que fueron huérfanos hace menos de 100 años. Del mismo sitio de cortos de PBS Iowa que mostramos en la parte 2, hoy les mostraremos dos ancianos que cuentan cómo fue su experiencia de ser llevados en trenes y cómo llegaron a encontrar su familia. En el segmento se aclara de lo que fue más cercano a alguien que estuvo vivo recientemente. De hecho, los videos fueron publicados en 2015, hace unos seis años. No podríamos asegurar si los dos ancianos siguen vivos, pero su historia es de hecho conmovedora y reveladora a la misma vez. Vamos con los segmentos y luego comentaremos para cerrar. On occasion, brothers and sisters had to be separated. This caused many tearful separations. They tried to keep siblings together as much as they could. Uh, mostly they just tried to put them in the same area. Most people did not want to take more than one child. He, he came in, we was on the very far end, the very end. And when he got down to us, he talked to us and asked us our names and what we, if we'd like to have a, live on a farm and we could have a pony to ride, you know, and things like that sounded good. We said, sure, sure, go ahead. Well, he only was going to take one of us. Now, I do not remember which one he had chosen, whether he even pointed or said who. But my brother Vic was holding onto my hand, just gripping it, crying. Didn't want to be separated. Stanley Cornell, who was born in 1920 in Elmira, New York, was also not a true orphan, though he too would ultimately ride the train to a new home. Stanley's father, a World War I veteran, had health problems associated with his wartime mustard gas exposure. After his wife died of tuberculosis in 1924, Floyd Cornell was unable to properly care for Stanley, Stanley's younger brother Victor, and sister Eloise. Stanley was a few months shy of his fifth birthday when his mother, Lottie, died. He still remembers how she cried out for her children near the end. When Mom was in her room crying and hollering and wanting, she said, Stan, Vic, please come see me, and crying and crying, night and day practically. We put this, and the window was up so high, about there on up, down below is not. I, I got the wagon up there, and then there's an orange crate that I set inside of the, the wagon so I could climb up to the window and, and get in the window because the door was locked to her room. He believes his relatives may have tried to keep him away from his mother because tuberculosis is contagious. As a young boy, however, he didn't understand. I, I crawled up in there and out to the inside the window and I helped my brother up then we both went over to her bed and she held her hand and was crying. And, and I'm, I don't remember what she had to say because uh, I was too young, I think, and also she was crying so. But I think what she told us, she knew she was dying. After his mother died, he sometimes felt like no one was looking after them, especially as his father tried to work while struggling with his own health problems. Two ladies came out in the big limousine to us. It looked like a big, and uh, we didn't have a car, of course, but uh, it looked like a big limousine. And they come in and talk to Dad, and then they call, talk to us, and ask us if we was happy. And I can remember saying, not really, no, not really. Yeah. I didn't want to complain, but uh, that was true because we weren't too happy. The boys were taken by the Children's Aid Society while an aunt took in their younger sister, then a toddler. At the orphanage, children were separated by gender. Even on the playground, a tall brick wall separated the boys from the girls. My brother and I were separated when we was in there for those six months, but in between the houses, they had about 15 feet of chicken wire so that we couldn't get, get together. And every day at noon, 
we'd uh, Vic would come from his side, I'd meet him down front and we'd talk to the fence. The children were given sparse and simple meals, milk, bread, or soup. Occasionally, they were given a piece of fruit. Then they'd come by before we finished and they'd leave an apple or a banana, orange, as, you know, for each one of us. And if you went outside, out of the building, to out, out in the yard, the bullies would take that away from you. It was a, not a very pleasant place to be at times. However, it was a place that we could stay warm, you know, at night, uh, and had some change of clothes and things like that. Before Stanley and Vic Cornell ended up with the Looty Texas farm family that would end up providing them a wonderfully happy childhood, they were sent away from a half dozen other households. Well, we lived in six different homes that rejected us after the first month or two or three months, sent us back to, because they didn't want to keep us. Some, some, and I don't, I don't know what the reason was. You know, I was too young to know whether we couldn't get along with our, their baby sister or brother or, or as mean to them or, or I don't know what. Stanley Cornell, now a Colorado resident, counts himself and his brother Vic, now living in Idaho, among those who were snatched from poverty and woe. The man who would raise the two boys as his own had never planned to take in a child from the orphan train that arrived in the Texas panhandle town of Wellington one December night in 1926. It was a neighbor who suggested it. He was in town that day, he bought a new Model T and he needed flaps on his windows on his car, so the farmer that rode in with him says, Mr. Deidre, you, you got two girls, 10 and 13. You've always wanted boys, at least a boy. Said, yeah, I'd like to have a boy. So he said, let's stop by. The children from the train were lined up. An agent traveling with the children encouraged the farmer to take both boys as Vic clung to his big brother's hand and cried. They only had each other and had already been to six other homes where it hadn't worked out. J.L. Deidre agreed to take both. His wife, waiting at home with the girls, had no idea her husband had even stopped to see the children from the train. Mom was wanting to sew, she liked to sew, but she's always done, you know, she wanted to sing her sewing machines, what she wanted. And she thought that was the day that he was going to get one for her. Well, he drives up and she, he goes in the house. He says, Mom, you and the girls go out there and get the groceries out of the back seat and it's still snowing and blowing, you know, so they go out there, and when one of the girls opened the door, they, they see the mo movement of the blanket and some voices, and they jump back, and one of them squealed. It scared scared. And finally, one of them pulled the blanket off, and there was just two white, toe-headed, white-headed kids there, you know, eating candy. And they picked us up and carried us in the house, just like it was worth a million dollars. Boy, they gave us a good home. That was home. Years later, after serving in World War II, Stanley would reunite with his birth father. His sister had found her brother several years earlier. Stanley let his birth father know that his childhood had turned out wonderfully. They kept in touch over the years, but he always saw his adoptive parents as his real parents. Bernadette Schaefer was 92 as of the filming of this documentary. She's also part of the shrinking group of living orphan train riders. Bernadette's birth mother admitted her to the New York Foundling Hospital when she was three months old, paying for her care there until she was no longer able. The woman surrendered her baby to the Catholic organization in early 1923, shortly after the girl's first birthday. When she was one and a half, Bernadette was sent on a train to Nebraska. She was placed with Elizabeth and Adolph Mick, who already had eight children. The family farmed near Lindsay, Nebraska. Bernadette loved her new family and life in the country. The Micks formally adopted Bernadette when she was eight. They had the dog Shepherd, and they had uh, cats and dogs and chickens and pigs and baby pigs and Oh, just so much stuff that I could play with. I just couldn't believe it. 
I felt wonderful because I felt that was the first time in my life that I felt like I was like I had a home. Con respecto a la primera historia del señor Stanley, es interesante que se mencione la tuberculosis de la madre y que eso pudo ser la causa de la separación con ella. Una enfermedad donde se tenga que aislar al familiar. Suena como que familiar, ¿no? Dos mujeres en una limusina son las que llegan a entrevistar a la familia. Podríamos suponer que eran adineradas y que andaban en una misión. Y que quizá los niños al ver un carro o un automóvil moderno o de hecho elegante, les daba ese tipo de, de mensaje de que algo venía o que se los iban a llevar. Los niños fueron tomados por la Children's Aid Society, la misma organización que fundó el señor Charles Lauren Brace, como lo mencionamos en la parte 1. Interesante que este ejemplo, el de Stanley, la asociación tomó a los varones, Stanley y su hermano Vic, pero prefirió dejar a la niña y al bebé con la tía. ¿Será que había preferencia por los más crecidos y un poco independientes? ¿Qué piensan ustedes? Una de las cosas que nos llamó más la atención fue que el padre biológico de Stanley fue soldado de la Primera Guerra Mundial y ahora Stanley fue soldado de la Segunda Guerra Mundial. ¿Será que eso estaba en esa agenda de que esa segunda generación de niños participara en la siguiente guerra? Una pregunta a analizar definitivamente. En el segmento número 2, la anciana Bernadette Schaffer fue entregada a la organización católica por su madre para que se hicieran cargo de ella. Pareciera que el sistema no ha cambiado mucho. En lugar de apoyar a una madre para hacerse cargo, hagamos que el sistema sea suficientemente pesado para que la madre no le queda otra que dar a su hija a cargo del supuesto gobierno. Bueno, en este caso la fundación católica que se encargaba de sistemas de huérfanos y ese tipo de cosas. Así que por ahora sería todo. Si tienen algún aporte que les sume a esta conversación, me encantaría escucharlo. Pero por ahora sería todo y nos vemos en la próxima. Si te gustó el contenido del canal, no olvides suscribirte, darle campanita para notificaciones, darle me gusta, comentar o compartir. Hasta la próxima.